Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to rock and roll all night and party every day with Eddie and Old Head. <laughs> that was, <laughs> my heart was in the right place with that, but... <laughs> If if we're rock and rolling all night, are we going to want to party every day? Like we should we should you know maybe put some time aside to just yeah. hang out and watch a when movie. When do you when do you <laughs> also when do you sleep? Everybody needs sleep. So you Hell can't, yeah, you can't. Uh, <laughs> it's like the movie the mo- in the movie role models, which I'll bring up later. Also, if you if you haven't seen it, where Paul Rudd's character says, "Hey, I like to rock and roll all night and part of every day. I usually have errands." Yeah. <laughs> There's a there's a there's a Pearl Jam album. I think it's the I think it's 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 a live album. I think it's live at Benaroya Hall, the uh, like kind of unplugged thing yeah. they did, like 2003, I think it was. And Eddie mentions that uh, I think it was Mike McCready thought it was part of Every Day <laughs> as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a real thing. <laughs> So, oh well, yeah. So, hello, cranked and ranked is the <laughs> is the podcast. <laughs> Man, I, I swear, like as we go on, the introductions are getting worse and worse. Like it's, I almost feel, like, I really do think that I'm going to spend a little time and I'm going to make like a pre-recorded intro with like a little bit of music and just like, ladies and gentlemen, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and then it will just cut to us and we can just start talking. There doesn't have to be any be cool. introductions at all. I because <laughs> I because I I just can't I can't get it right. I'm not I'm not a presenter as it were i don't know what i'm doing or per, per, perhaps our unprofessional qualities make us endearing that's true i, I do think maybe it's a little <laughs> bit half and half so I, I guess i guess we i don't know people seem to dig it <laughs> so uh, so hello people out there thanks for uh, listening to cranked and ranked and thank you for uh, listening to the third and final chapter of our kiss discography ranking so obviously this doesn't need much of an introduction Although I guess some people do just want to hear the top albums. They don't want to hear us talking about the the last of 24 albums. So um, <laughs> today is the top eight, number eight down to number one of our uh, top Kiss albums. And th- it was an interesting thing doing this list because I try so hard every time we do these band discographies to make it half about my experience and my preferences and the things I enjoy and half about thinking about what the band did as a whole with their discography, with their albums, with the, the, how they moved from one album to another. And, and so I, it's, it's with kiss, it's kind of difficult to do that because like we talked about before, it's almost like talking about two different bands with the eighties and the seventies. But I feel like I found a, a nice middle ground in between the the things that I love and the things that I just think are good you know for for what they are um yeah but either way this is going to be a fun episode because it's just I mean I'm going to be talking about eight albums that I think are fucking awesome so <laughs> this is uh <laughs> this is this is great if you had anything to, to say before we start this off I think you know it like I said last episode about two-thirds up I love a majority of their albums a lot. Yeah. So, you know, these top eight, a lot of these could switch places on any other day. But, uh, yeah, this is... I, f- I feel like I've given a fair shot to all all eras. Yeah. You know, and um, you'll find some classics lower down and you'll find some underappreciated gems further up this is just you know for anybody who hasn't followed the previous two episodes yeah. but uh yeah really uh, i'm really excited to talk about these <laughs> yeah because yeah so yeah so let, let's just let's just jump right into it because who knows how long this will take with our with our gushing over albums <laughs> we love and our tangents that we are known for um so let's go ahead and get started oh, yeah. as usual eddie starts it off what is your number eight kiss album my number eight Kiss album is Dynasty. Oh, all right, all right. I lo- man, I like how you said that. I'm gonna start calling it Dynasty, and not, yeah, I, and not I've, Dynasty. I've I've always been like, it, is it pronounced different in different areas? Because like, I I've heard people say Dynasty, and I've heard people say Dynasty. I I, I, sp- I just think it's a it's a regional thing. I just think, or it was just from your part of the world. There's a lot of words that you guys pronounce differently than we do. 
And most of, and most of the time, you guys are right, and we're not. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna go with Dynasty. But it just changes because, like over here, we also had a really popular television show in the '80s called Dynasty, and it's yeah. really weird to think about it said any other way because that's what it was. That's what it was called. It was called Dynasty. They didn't say Up Next Dynasty because that sounds like <laughs> a show about dentists. <laughs> what did you say? What did he say? Dentistry. <laughs> Anyway, Dynasty, yes, uh, yes, let's do this. So I really like this album. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people always call it, and, and even I was guilty of it last episode, but I only in relation to, like, two tracks on the whole album. Mm-hmm. People tend to refer to it as the disco album. Yeah, that, That's unfair, because there are some serious hard rocking songs on here. Mm-hmm. And, yep. you know... There's the cool thing about these kind of later 70s and into the early 80s albums is the presence of Ace Frehley on vocals. And yeah. you and I, you and I share the love of, you know, Ace, Ace is both of our favorite member. Yeah. So this hear, hearing him yeah, pronounced. I, I, on, I do. I do feel a bit more. Uh, like a, a lot, a bit more love for those few albums where he does sing because early on he wrote songs, he just didn't do any of the vocals. Like, you know, way back to Cold Gin, Cold Gin was his song, but he, I think yeah. it was Gene that sang that one. So, these albums where he starts singing on them, I'm just like, yeah, I love it. I, I, I talked about it last time, I love it when everybody in the band sings, I just think it's so much fun. And that's the thing, he, he doesn't have like this classically trained vocal approach but that's no. like exactly the charm you know he's kind of like he's he's on pitch but it's you know just sung in a way where it's like i'm rock and roll as shit and i don't care i feel like you it's know? the same way he plays guitar he's not trying too hard to be flashy or impress people it's just this is what comes out of him and yeah um i yeah i love it i love his delivery but he he definitely isn't a great singer but um <laughs> i just but he almost feels like he's he's legit you know how like with like yeah. with like nwa you had easy e who was actually a gangbanger and they yeah. and they brought him on and he wasn't the best rapper so that's kind of like ace feels like he's really a, a rock and roll dude from the streets and that, and yeah. that, that comes across in his vocals I think that, you know, level of authenticity just just really adds to it, you mm-hmm. know, as well, because it, like we mentioned in one of the previous episodes, I can't remember which, we we both have made at some point the Ace the other Ace Freely <laughs> Kiss album. Yeah. <laughs> that that isn't Ace Freely, but um yeah, I I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that one. That one later oh, later in this episode. <laughs> But yeah, going back to Dynasty, let I'm gonna go into the track by track. Uh, I was made for loving you is the dis the disco song. Yes, it's it's a damn good one though. And you know, I know Gene hates it. Going the do 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 do. I there's just it's undeniably catchy though. But that's and, the and thing. honestly, if you're if you ever came to me and said, "Hey, do you do you want to listen to a disco song?" I'd be like, "Yeah, put on I was made for loving you" because I can't think of one that's better. <laughs> because yeah. there are, there are other famous disco songs, but none of, none of them have the charm that I was made for loving you has in my opinion. It it's just it, there's something about it. There's a vibe there that's just so cool. And uh to see kiss doing that kind of thing it, it's a nice change of pace because you f- for you and i don't want a band to make the same album twice no so it's no, absolutely it's not. always cool it's always cool to hear this sort of stuff yeah also then, also it just goes along with the kind of band that they were they had already done a, a movie and and solo albums and it's just why wouldn't they do you know, you know, flirt with a different genre that was popular at the time. It just seems, it doesn't seem like a way to cash in. It almost seemed just like, why wouldn't we do this? You know? <laughs> yeah. It, it, but like, that's the thing. Immediately after it, you get this hard rocking cover of 2000 man mm-hmm. with Ace Frehley on vocals. Yeah. So it, it, this, this album does unfairly get a bad rap. I think it's really, really good. Yeah. Um, you know, sure know something. Oh uh, yeah, yes, oh, I love it. Dirty living. You know, it, there is some disco presence 
sprinkled on a few of these other tracks, L- but the, the only the only straight up disco song on it is the opening I was made for can, loving you. Can I say I say something interesting here though that I that I thought of just recently when I was thinking about this album. If if it had been ten songs worth of disco kiss songs, I might have actually liked it more. Really? I, I don't know. Because I don't know what it would have sounded like, but it I don't know. It for some part of me thinks if they had just done an actual full disco album and then moved on. I would probably yeah. love it. I would just be like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> if I, you know, I just get these different sides of kiss and, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's because of that. I think that it, the album does feel a bit, uh, lopsided, I guess at times with the different kinds of songs, but that it, it doesn't really bother me anymore, but I could understand maybe at the time people being like, Oh, this is, they're all over the place here. You know? Yeah. You got charisma as well, uh, mm-hmm. magic touch. Um, yeah, magic touch. I, I don't know why. I like started halfway through the word there. That, that <laughs> happens was, to me that all was the a, time. <laughs> yeah, magic touch. Awesome eighties rock precursor. Could have easily been on one of their no makeup glam albums, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, hard times. More Ace Freely. Fuck yeah! That's a great song. This. That's one of those songs that can really pull me out of a bad place. If I feel like shit, I will put this song on and it'll just immediately bring my mood right back up because this kind of Ace Frehley motivational, shouty, get up off your feet, things ain't so bad kind of kind of feeling. Yeah. And honestly, favorite song on the album, like hands down. You know what? I, it pro- well, I think Sure Knows Something is my favorite, but I think Hard Times is a close second. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those songs I really relate to as well. Because like there, there are times in my life where I can think, yeah, I'm glad I'm not there, you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and <laughs> um, X-ray eyes, cool chorus, cool chorus on that one. And uh, save your love is this upbeat, intense rocker. Um, yeah, Dynasty, unfairly maligned as a disco record, when in actual fact. It's got a lot more to it than just being, oh, that time Kiss did a shitty disco album. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's... Um, I mean, it made my top eight, yeah. so it's doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, it's, it's so, moving on quickly, really not very far back, um, and there's similar qualities on this album, but this is what, like... Like I just looked at what albums I had listed. I'm like, yeah, from from album number eight, you're gonna hear me just talking about how much I love these albums. And this is an album I feel like people do like it, but not as much as I think that they should. I think this is uh, I don't, I'm just gonna jump into it. the The second best Kiss solo album, the Paul Stanley solo album. Yes, it is fucking great. It's there are so many great songs on this album. So for those of you who don't know, 100 percent 1978, each member of Kiss put out a solo album with their own backing band, with their own songs. And um, honestly, like that's still one of those things that I wish other bands would do that. Like I realize the quality may not be as good. Like if Metallica did solo albums for each member, they might be varying levels of meh. But I don't I don't care. <laughs> I would just I would just enjoy it. I would enjoy hearing, you know, those kind of things. Because I, I love I don't know why this this the idea of them putting out these albums and the different personalities of these albums have, it's so interesting to me. But the Paul Stanley one, like two songs in, in particular on this album, uh, Wouldn't You Like to Know Me and It's All Right, should have been massive hits. I do yeah. not understand why they were not. They just seem like songs that you should still be hearing on classic rock radio today. They should be there. Agreed. And and really, like the best thing about this album for me, because I, you know, I like Paul Stanley is my second favorite Kiss member, and it's mostly because he is so good with melody and vo- like vocal melodies. Like he yeah. can take just a, a basic kind of cool riff and he'll write something kind of cool that goes over like a really memorable hook. And they're all over this album. And if anything, the Paul Stanley solo album 
kind of gives me a glimpse into an alternate reality where maybe Kiss fizzled out after Dynasty and they all went their separate ways. I feel like Paul Stanley would have been the most successful member on his own. I, yeah. I, I don't know how long that success would have lasted into the 80s, but um, I feel like you know Ace, Ace would have held his own like he did anyway. But I really do think that that Paul Stanley had the ability, whether on his own or with, you know, collaborators, he could come up with some really great songs. It's, it's almost as if he went off and made an excellent Kiss album all by himself. That's how it sounds. It, it, it doesn't necessarily strike me as if... Because it sounds extremely cohesive as well. It, yeah, I, it I doesn't think probably sound the only... The only not non kiss thing that comes out to me is the is hold me, touch me, think of me when we're apart. That's very. I yeah. guess it could have been on a kiss album, but that feels more like you know if he did his own solo thing. That's that's what I would expect. But there's just so many rocking songs on here, and it's it's one that actually I think gets better the more that I listen to it because I just it is a. Uh, it's up there with those kind of albums that you put on and each track comes on and you're like, oh, it's this one. Like it's it's just back to back great songs. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's to, to me, it's like a, it's like the polar opposite of what Gene Simmons did, although I do enjoy Gene Simmons album in a different way. But this <laughs> one just sounds like a dude that it's almost like, you know, he already was ready for this. I don't know whose whose idea the solo albums were like a, like the seed of it like where it started. It may have been their management. Who knows? But um, I feel like Paul was the one that was like, "Oh, I'm already ready. <laughs> I'm already yeah. ready to do this solo album thing. I got this ready to go." And you can tell it's just a dude nailing it with an album that he just I don't know. He th- he threw together a great band. Um, um, funny enough, it's. Uh, it's got Bob Kulick on guitar, which, wow. which he is the older brother of Bruce Kulick, who would later be in Kiss as a, as a permanent member. I was um, unaware of that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's pronounced Miliwake, which is Algonquin for the good land. I fucking love those movies, man. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I don't got much more to add about the Paul Stanley album. It's, it's just great. Um, I, I can't, it's, I, 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 but I feel like sometimes it doesn't get the love it deserves. So that's why I feel more passionate about it. Cause 'cause there's not enough people saying this album rules because it does. And so that's why it's my number eight, Paul Stanley from 1978. Can I just say now this, this is pretty shocking. I hadn't listened to the Paul Stanley solo album until we did this. Oh, and I, shit. I had my fucking mind blown and I kicked myself for passing up on it all these years because yeah. I, remember, I remember people were saying, Ace's album is the best, but... You know, Paul's is damn good too. Like I think, it, I think that they're um, um, really great in different ways. Mm, I almost feel like yeah. in, comparing the Paul Stanley album to the Ace Frehley album, it's it's you know, as they say, apples and oranges. Like they're you know, it's yeah. like it. it I, I just you know, obviously we had to compare them for this because we're ranking all of them. But <laughs> I really do think that it stands on its own. Yeah, it's it's like well, they literally took their part of Kiss and did a whole album of that. Yeah, you know, yeah, which is a cool way to to look at it. I wonder if you were to take some of the tracks from each like each of the four albums and put them together, would it just sound like a a, a Kiss album? I, I with feel a like a bunch of sessions. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that's how they did it anyway. I think they individually wrote stuff. And maybe brought it in and worked it out, you know, fleshed it out together occasionally. But I, I, I think that a lot of times Paul Stanley comes with a complete song, and same, oh, with, same with for Gene. sure. So I, I really think that it would just sound like this with less tracks from each member. Obviously, kind of like what you know, Dynasty would would end up being. True. So, for my number seven, mm-hmm. I've gone for Love Gun. Oh, all right. 
right. So this is a fucking awesome album. Mm-hmm. I stole your love. What an oh, opening song. To yeah. to be honest, to be honest, I think this could be my favorite Kiss opener. It's it's a really great one. It's a great way to start because it really just kicks you right in the face, right out of the gate. Um, you know, obviously, then you get Christine 16. You know, <laughs> these these 70s bands were pretty predatory, but uh, they wrote good music. So <laughs> I, 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 still, I, still, yeah. I still don't get that. It's like it, it seemed like it started maybe in the 50s with like oldies groups, like, you know, doing yeah. songs about girls that were 16 happy birthday sweet 16 just that all, kind of stuff. I, 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 but i've never understood it i'm just like i guess i've never especially once i got into my 20s i, I would look at somebody <laughs> that was 16 and be like fuck no like yeah they, they have no they will have no clue what they're doing i don't want anything to do with the 16 year old but for some reason in the world of music they're all they're all just like we're rock and rollers now. We must have a girl that barely knows what she's doing. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I guess it's a control thing. I don't know. Either way, I'm not on board with it. <laughs> From the fifties, like fast forward thirty years, you get seventeen by Winger. <laughs> hey, at least he you know, in Texas that's legal. <laughs> so at least at least he went up, you know, to that level. But still, yes. Why? Why? I don't understand. It's, it's it's just I don't know, man. <laughs> I can't explain it. <laughs> there's a there's a song from the I believe it's the, either the late seventies or early eighties by a by a singer called Benny Mardonis, and I think it's called Into the Night. And the song starts off with "She's just sixteen years old." Leave yeah. her alone, they <laughs> say. And in the video, he's at the fucking parents' door. <laughs> And he turns around and says that line and rolls his eyes after he says the line. <laughs> and by the end of the video, he literally shows up in the little girl's window and, and puts her on a fucking flying carpet and they fly away into the night. It's actually a really good song, but I'm all like, couldn't he, why does it have to be, why is there this desperation to get with a young girl? I don't understand it. But we're, we're digressing, but I mean, not really, because we're talking about Christine 16, but... I mean, it's it, I, it, it will it will never become a thing that somebody can explain to me because I'm just like write a song about something else, or be ambiguous about the woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like you know, if if you happen to be that fucked up that you're looking for a 15 year old, then just leave that out of the song. I I think that there may be a certain level of of like provocation with it. They might have just been writing it for the shock value, but that I that I can see that in some cases. But on the on the flip side, you know, there's nothing to say that these might look a little <laughs> little bad in a court case if one to one were to arise. That's, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies so, and gentlemen, I, I submit as evidence <laughs> the song Christine Sixteen. <laughs> case dismissed. <laughs> oh man. Can you right, imagine, right. Back imagine, to Love Gun. <laughs> you just imagine saying the saying to like the attorney's just there. Oh, we're fucked. The judge is a Kiss fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, got Love for Sale. Hard hitting rocker. I love that one. So good. Shock me. The first Ace song. Always love when he's on vocals. This yeah. is a, this is a catchy tune. You know it. it I don't know whether or not it's it's there's a certain shyness to it that it's his first song, but it's still strong and you it's know, great. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow and tonight is catchy as all hell. Love yep. Gun, the title track, and damn, it's a sexy one too. That's the, that's the thing about about Love Gun is that it seems like a song that would start off an album, but it starts off side two of this album. That's how confident they were in what they had going here. Hell yeah, and the. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you watched the Alive 4 concert? Have you, like, watched the DVD of of it? Is it's, it the the orchestra one or whatever? Yeah. No, yeah, I haven't that seen one. that. There's, during Love Gun, right at the start, Paul Stanley grabs this, like, rope, puts his boot into this little hoop at the bottom, and flies out to this oh, platform in the yeah. middle of the crowd... And does the entirety of Love Gun out 
on this plinth in the middle of the crowd. I believe that's a thing they do every show. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's always Love Gun, but I think that he it's become a normal thing where he he gets on the little thing and goes out into the crowd. That's so cool. Yeah. It's got to be kind of scary, though. You're thinking, this is, like, the one thing holding me from plummeting into a bunch of fans. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I can see it. And not any more scary than Tommy Lee's rotating drum kit or anything. Oh, you know, that, that, Jesus <laughs> Christ, that's, yeah. That's a little more... Because if, if, if you fall... If that thing falls while you're upside down, it's not just you falling. It's the shit falling on top of you as well. Yeah. So that's all I could think of. was like, that's that would hurt, for sure. The, the thing is, as well... Didn't it get stuck? I know we. I know we. We. It was done the little... roll. It was the roller coaster one. For yeah. The last tour. There's a video of him on where the, the the drum kit goes on this little roller coaster thing and it gets stuck up there. Christ, that's got to be so fucking nerve wracking. But um, all yeah. part of the, all, all part of the rock and roll experience. Totally, and it needs to be an element of danger there. But uh, yeah, you get Hooligan, which is a fun track. Mm -hmm. Almost Human, one of those grooving uh, gene yeah. tracks. That's a good one. Yeah. Plastic Casser. It's hard to fuck with these 70s albums, dude. They're just great. Um, yeah. And then she kissed me. Weird choice for a cover, but it has the <laughs> word kiss in there. So fuck it. You know? Yeah. It, that's that's one that I'm like, it, it, it's unnecessary, but it doesn't bother me. It's I think it's pretty yeah. fun. <laughs> it always reminds me of the opening to that uh cult 80s movie um what's it called adventures and babysitting that, oh it, yeah. Op yeah it opens with that but yeah with the with the original song and then he kissed me yeah yeah but yeah that that's that's my number seven is it's love gun it's badass it's Hell such yeah. a I, such a good album i absolutely agree with you so much so that it is not my number seven it is much higher up in this list Ooh. um but my number seven is an album that you talked about on the last episode. Was it even on the last one, or was it the one before? You, this may have been a part three album for you. I don't remember. Uh, my number seven Let's is "Dress to Kill." Dress to Kill from nineteen seventy five. It was an episode. It was a. It was a bottom episode one, but I moved it up because it's. Oh, it's the places. one that you switched places with. Uh, uh, Hot in the shade. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so this is a part three or uh, whatever. It's a, to a top half or top third album for me um mostly just because it is a blast to listen to yeah it's real short some of the songs are brief to the point where it's like all right we got a song done let's move on but something about that quality of this album makes it seem fun to me because it feels like an album of a, a, a made by a band that is on their way up like they haven't broken yet but they almost feel the momentum, and so they're just like, let, let, we got to get this album out and keep mo keep on moving. And that's yeah. what this album feels. This feels like a, a in progress, keep on moving. Where it's almost like they didn't even they didn't even take time to go off tour in order to make it. I know they did, but still, <laughs> it just feels like one of those things where it just came out of them as they were driving down the road. They they released this album, which has classic fucking songs on it. Now the production is a bit light. Um, the guitars feel a little, a little soft, but that's a quality of it that I've just grown to enjoy and I don't really care. Um, yeah. but I, but maybe at the time it may have been seen as a little bit lightweight in the production area. Um, but like every track is enjoyable. There's a couple like, you know, like ladies in waiting is like, it's, it's very minimal effort rock and roll. <laughs> There's not a yeah. lot going on in that song. But then you get to side two, and for me, the last three tracks on side two it, it is like one of the strongest, you know, endings of a Kiss album with "She Love Her All I Can" and "Rock and Roll All Night." Like that's just yeah a really great ending to an album, and um, also "Love Her All I Can" later uh, covered by Anthrax um, with uh, during the John Bush era. Was that on the? Um kiss my ass compilation it may have been i'm not really sure i think no i think they did a, a different one no i think maybe it was lover all i can anyway i think i've got the cassette of that somewhere here <laughs> i oh, found it in, yeah I found it in like a record record shop and i thought oh i gotta have that yeah, yeah. That, that was a big deal when it came out in fact in fact a, a memory that dates 
that era is that uh, the album came out, but they also released like a home video with yeah. uh, classic Kiss footage and some other shit. But I remember my brother worked at a video store and he brought home the laser disc of that. No way. <laughs> and we <laughs> and we watched it on laser disc and I was just like, holy shit, that dates it because who the fuck talks about <laughs> laser discs anymore? They're it's like, like LP size DVDs. <laughs> exactly. Only they were like twice as heavy. If you dropped <laughs> that shit, it was over. And the worst thing about laser discs was that you had to turn the movie over halfway through the fucking movie. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember like, because Laserdisc were a big thing because that was the first place where you got audio commentary along yeah. with stuff. So I remember my brother bringing home the Terminator 2 one and I was all like, oh, I'm going to dub this because I want to, you know, dub the the commentary along with it. And I just remember you get to a point where you're like, oh, shit, now I got to pause the VHS and I got to flip the, the, the <laughs> laser disc over and start it again. And I'm just like, no, no. There's, there's no way that anyone's going to put up with this because I'm just like, I'll take the lower quality VHS over having to flip something over halfway through a, a movie. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Anyway, um, but yeah, that's my fun little tidbit about that album. But D- Dress to Kill is what we were talking about. Um, it's a classic album. I don't have a lot more to add. It's um, the weakest of the classic albums, because I would say like the classic Kiss albums end after Love Gun. I think that once the band becomes splintered or they have like different people playing, like, you know, Dynasty doesn't totally have Peter Chris on everything. Yeah. And... Um, so I think when it comes to those classic albums where the band was all together, I think Dressed to Kill's the weakest of those albums, but that's saying pretty much nothing cuz man that, that they just they were nailing it with everything they put out. So um but yeah, so it's it's my number 7, Dressed to Kill. Cool. So I think my number 6 could be yeah I was thinking to myself then, is it probably, in my opinion, the most underrated Kiss album? Probably. So I've gone for number six, Unmasked. Okay, cool. So first thing I'll say, no, they're not Unmasked. Wait three more (laughs) years. (laughs) It's because because they didn't call it Unmakeuped. Yeah. Then (laughs) then it would have been correct. (laughs) Yeah, it, it it is the last album until 98's Psycho Circus, though, that the original 70s lineup was technically together because it's got the original lineup on the front. Even if... I don't, I don't think Peter Chris plays on this, does he, at all? No. No, he doesn't. No. Nah. He, he may play on one. No, no, Peter Chris. It's Anton Fig all the way through. Ah. Peter, Peter Chris uh, is just credited as because I guess technically he was still a member of the band. I am. I, it's got to be weird just having that that level of popularity and then have all this drama going on with band members. And it's like, well, what do you do? Like, do you you've made you've made your career being these four guys, and like, you know, yeah. if you're having trouble with two of them, or if those two are having trouble with you, like, like it's. I, 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 I realize that they're rock stars and their lives are not very hard, but I feel for them a little bit because it's yeah. like, well, shit, we fucking made this together and now things are falling apart. So it just, like I said, it makes me sad to think about the, this, this era because it's just like, man, I, it just, it just sucks that things couldn't just last. I mean, cause they're, I mean, I don't know. There are great bands that, you know, Aerosmith, all the same fucking dudes today yeah. <laughs> from their first album. So clearly <laughs> it can happen, you know? So I guess in the case of kiss, it just, it couldn't, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. It, so I'm, I'm going to go into my track by track. Do it. Cool. So I've got, is that you, uh, this album, <laughs> yeah, th- this album often gets called the power pop album. And from mm-hmm. the very first track, I can see that. It's a glossier, poppy approach, but not veering into the glam metal realm quite yet. You know, you get Shandy is is a nice, chill song. Talk to me is catchy as all hell. Yeah. Naked City, one of those great driving at night tracks. Uh, what mm-hmm. makes the world go round has this cool sound to it with those synth parts going on. 
That, Tomo- that seems to have a little bit of a disco tinge in it, too, what makes the world go round. Yeah. Tomorrow could easily be a sitcom intro, and I love that. <laughs> you know, I, I absolutely love this. I love this song. <clears throat> um, I just love those little... Um, do, 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 fall in love. God, so... <sighs> I don't know how to describe it, man. I just, I just love this like happy, upbeat side to kiss, and it's. I love underappreciated albums that impress me, yeah. and this one like is one of those like middle albums that n- nobody seems to mention. Everybody talks about you know Dynasty and music from the older, but nobody ever touches on Unmasked, you know. And I love this one. <laughs> I, I guess it's be- because it's it's so similar to Dynasty in a lot of ways. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. They have their own qualities, I think, set them apart. But, yeah, it, it is true. Unmasked is one that you don't hear talked about that much. Yeah, you, you get you get two sides of the coin is another catchy track. Really another, enjoying another this Fraley record. Song. Yeah, that's the thing as well. There's a decent Ace Fraley presence on this one too. Um, and it's kind of kind of weird to to see as well as you look at the first makeup era kiss body of work peter chris is like the extra singer and then that gradually shifts over to ace and ace takes on that role of the third voice um yeah so i guess this is the first one that doesn't have any peter chris vocals on it at all I think so, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. She's so European is a is a poppy rocker. I'm, I'm still like trying to f- one. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. Like <laughs> it, it, mean, it means she doesn't shave her legs. I was, I thought so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um easy easy as it seems, smooth track. Uh Torpedo Girl is a fun bouncy track i love the like i say i love the increased presence of ace on the albums following love gun i also love the double kick outro you know before double kick was metal and people just did it because it was people just did it because it sounded cool you know i love hearing these early examples of double kick where people finally realized oh we can do a drum roll with our feet that's pretty cool (laughs) you know um but yeah where am I at? Oh, I've scrolled back down through my notes and here we are at the last track. Yeah. You're all that I want fun track to close out the record. Unmasked is underrated in my opinion and deserves way more recognition. And that's what, that's why I've put it so high. Yeah. I mean, that that's the one thing to say about all of their albums in my, in my opinion, up through revenge, even the weakest of their albums are, very enjoyable yeah like they they never put out anything that that didn't engage with me in some way yeah so um and this is one of those ones where it's like sure it's kind of light and poppy overall but it's got some really great hooks on it and i don't know it just it it, and it feels like 1980 like the whole album you know so there's the nostalgic quality to it all but yeah I, I agree. It's a great album. Cool. But I talked about that one last time. You did so indeed. That one, that one is not my number six. My number six is um, the the one album from, I think, the last episode where um, I, 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 I was really confused by your ranking of it. <laughs> 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 uh, my number five, or number six, sorry. My number six uh, is Creatures of the Night. Hey. Which, so this is where we get to a point where I had to really stop trying to focus so much on the albums that I enjoy and the albums that I listen to the most and take those and put them in the context with what they did, what they accomplished, the songwriting on it, the presentation of the album, the progression from one to the other. And so really, if you're just talking about albums that I like to listen to, Creatures of the Night is way higher up than even number six. But because it's fucking great. We talked about this album actually already in the 1982 episode that we did, because I believe it was in both of our top fives, right? Or was it not? Yeah. I think so, yeah. And this album just has such a big sound. Sounds big, 
the it drums does sound, sound huge. fucking big. Um, and, uh, and of course it's, it's, you know, Eric Carr on drums. And although, yeah, no, 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 never mind. He is, he is on the album cover as well. This, they, they had, they had already completely parted ways with, uh, Peter Chris at this point, but, yeah. um, it's just not only a big sound, big drums, big fucking songs. I don't know. I, I mean, obviously this is viewed as the, the reaction, their reaction to the reaction for music from the elder, where yeah. they were like, all right, well, let's just get back to writing some rock songs. But they could have just gone back and phoned it in and done some shit that sounds very similar to their early work. And I think people would have been fine with it. But this is this is progressing past that. Yeah. And that's why I love it so much, because it doesn't sound like a retread album. It sounds like them saying like, all right, we we're going to go back and make a full on rock album. But guess what? We're better at doing that now. And yeah. It's, there's just so much cool shit. Obviously, you have like classics. Like I love it loud is a song that I'm pretty sure they've played every concert since this album came out. Yeah, and we talked about it last time. Um, I still love you is one of the greatest breakup songs ever written. It's just so great. It's such a just the 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 different levels because the the verses of the song kind of sound like they're coming from a guy that's trying to be kind of cool about the breakup. Just the way, the way that, the way that the vibe is, he's just like singing about some things that went, didn't go right. Like, you know, those aren't the lyrics, obviously, but you know, it just, <laughs> it feels a little more like he's, you know, he's like, he's like, I'm, I'm ready to accept this. But then as soon as you, as soon as it builds up to the chorus, you realize that motherfucker's not ready. And he's like, I still love you. And it's just <laughs> so fucking good. It's just, it just feels like the, like, cause I just think, especially when you're younger, that's what breakups are like. Yeah. You, it, you just, you're dramatic about everything while you probably realize that you shouldn't be being that dramatic, but that would, you're, that, that would be dishonest, you know? So <laughs> I don't know. I love that song. Um, and it's just an undeniably solid album and one of their best albums, um, we we talked about this last time, so you know you, all these all these great songs. You know, obviously the creatures of the night itself, and then you know War Machine, Rock and Roll Hell, Danger. There, I mean, there's it's it's this is an, an all killer no filler kind of album to me. Um, it, it is once again them collaborating with other songwriters, but as I've said before, I don't really care. I just think that it's a it's like more like a footnote or something to put like, by the way, this was, you know, not 100% written by the members of kiss, but it doesn't matter because yeah. they, they turned out a fantastic album. And this is the one that I really wish. I do think that on the Kissology DVDs, there is a concert from this era. I think this is when they had the tank behind them. If I remember. Yeah. Right. Eric and Carr on top of it. Yeah, and I just it's just great. But this is one of those ones where I I wish that they would somehow find a really great quality live recording from this tour and put it out on vinyl because I would love it. And I, I realized that this was around the time that they were having, you know, issues with their popularity and they were playing smaller venues and there were lower crowd turnouts and stuff. But I mean, I don't know. I almost feel like like Kiss needed that they needed to go through, they needed to come back down to earth a little bit because I think, yeah, <laughs> I really do think as much as especially Gene Simmons, but as much as those guys seem like overblown rock and roll guys, you know, I, I think that there is a level of uh, humanity that they, especially Paul Stanley possesses. And I think it's because of this if they had literally taken off and been super popular from day one and never looked back. Yeah. It may be, it may be a different story. Uh, but I don't know. It, it, I, I, once again, when we're talking about discographies of bands, these, the ebbs and flows are what make them more interesting. I don't want to talk about 20 albums where a band was successful for 20 albums straight, because most of the time that's going to mean that there's very little variety and there's a lot less to talk about because the interesting thing about talking about these albums with us is not necessarily the ranking, but talking about not only our, our feelings about them, but the the public perception of them and how well they did and and you know how are they how are they remembered you know in this case 
40 years. Holy shit. Almost 40 years later. Yeah. Shit. Next year, it'll be 40 years old. Jesus this Christ. This fucking album. Meaning um, anyway. that music from The Elder is now approaching its 40th oh, yeah, this that'll year. Be, that'll be this year. Yeah. Holy fuck. <laughs> so um, anyway, so Creatures of the Night, though, is one of those things where it's interesting that it happened around a time where they weren't as popular. But this album, to me, should have just shot them way back up to the top. But I think in yeah. 1982, unfortunately, this was prior to the big rock boom, which kind of started with you know, Quiet Riot and Motley Crue and stuff like that, which I guess the first Motley Crue album was also 82, right? Or was it 81? 81, Too Fast for Love happened, but Shout at the Devil came out in 83, which was, I mean, 83 really is where the big hair glam metal stuff really hit its stride. Yeah, but I I feel like maybe this album was a little bit ahead of its time. For sure. And then, and then unfortunately, they would move into more poppy territory, which I guess in some cases, some people loved that and then other people didn't. But anyway, Creatures of the Night is just one that I almost feel like it just, it sticks out like this, like if we were looking at like a, a graph of yeah. like how I feel about their albums, it's, the, it's, a, it's a bunch of albums where, sure, some, some of the spikes go a little bit higher, but this one goes way the fuck up in the middle of it, like a big middle finger <laughs> just sticking yeah. up in this era of Kiss. Um, and so uh, that's why it is my number six, Creatures of the Night. It's cool to think about as well that during this era, they had... It was the makeup incarnation of Kiss, but they had two different members. So it's kind yeah. of this... Two kind new of this, characters. Yeah, it's this like transitional period where they're still in their makeup era, but there's two different guys. You know, you've got Eric Carr and Vinnie Vincent. I think I think we touched on this previously. Vinnie Vincent must have had like definitely the most short lived face paint out of all of them. I'd like I'd like yeah. to know how many gigs he actually played with it on. Like I'm sure you can find that. The, the kiss is well documented online. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I'll have to look that up. I mean it does look cool, but they had to they had to undergo a a big old change to well, prove themselves really. But yeah. Yeah, well I mean he he's not he but he's not even represented on an album uh with makeup. Like on Creatures of the Night, it's it's still Ace that's on the album cover. I was going to say as well, it is is it Ace playing on Creatures? No. I was going yeah. But it's I weird cuz he's in the video as well for I Love It Loud, but But I don't I don't think that even I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it is. It, I don't think Vinnie Vincent is even on Creatures of the Night. Um, hold on, let me let me see what they have here. So one one of them is uh, oh no, never mind, never mind. Vinnie Vincent does play some lead on here. Ah, that's so cool. okay, never mind. He is on this album. I don't know why I thought that. So yeah, he <laughs> he does he does play on here, but unfortunately, he didn't get included on the album cover. So that sucks. But you know, yeah, would have been kind of cool. Would have been kind of cool to see both of them on the on the front with that makeup, but uh, yeah, that's that's just a little extra, little extra nugget. <laughs> yeah, I still I still really do like this album cover though, the original one anyway. The the later one without the makeup, I'm all like, what? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Why did they do this? Because it's not not only that, not only is it a picture of the band, but it's a picture of, with a guitar player who isn't even on the album. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Bruce Kulick is anywhere on this album and yet he's on the the updated cover. So it's Weird. almost like they it's almost like they said fuck you to Vinnie Vincent two times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, poor Vinny. <laughs> cool. So okay, now I'm in my top 5. Yeah. So my number 5 Kiss album Paul Stanley. Yeah, wow, even higher up than me. I'm I'm okay with this. <laughs> it's it's massively underrated mm-hmm. and if I could t- if I could tie albums on this show, it would be right next to Ace Frehley. And that's Not and that's di- an interesting thing that this album that you just now heard it rocketed into your top 5. Like it just shows its quality. Yeah. Like it it's fucking phenomenal. Tonight you belong to me, you know, begins with Paul Stanley serenading his way into the pants of every woman in the Mm -hmm. crowd before making a Kiss record all by himself. You know, move on. 
I've noticed there's female backing vocals on like all the studio albums. Were they recorded in the same same studio with the same people? I feel like I ask this question every episode. <laughs> I don't think we've covered that yet. I don't know. So it's the so it's so it's got the pr- the production by Jeff Glicksman. Didn't know if they had like the same session band for all four members. Yeah, because the, the 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 Ace Frehley album was produced by Eddie Kramer. So it's and that's yeah. So yeah, I do think that maybe they just have similar. They try. They tried to go for a similar sound on the albums because they don't sound vastly different sonically from each other. Um, there might That's be the might be minor changes here and there, but um, they still seem to complement each other in some sort of bizarre way. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, ain't ain't quite right. Has a slow city drive at night vibe. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't Wouldn't you like to know me? Yeah. Is infectiously fun. It that sh- I agree that should have been a hit. It it like parts parts of that song f- sound like they could be on the Sex Pistols album, like not, yeah. like not vocally but musically. It sounds very similar to like a Holidays in the Sun or something like that, um, which is interesting to me because this was one year after uh, yeah. the Bollocks came out. But it's also done in a in a like kind of glossy flamboyant way at the same time so maybe it's so more it's of a it's more of a uh what's the what's the group like a new york dolls kind of thing maybe i don't know yeah i th- I, i'm thinking more down that more down that road yeah, it, yeah take me away uh together as one <laughs> it's this rocking power ballad absolute bangers in a row so far also you know one of two brackets tracks on this album you should one um, another one of your many projects should be doing an album with with nothing but brackets titles for all the songs and the album title and then may, and yeah. then maybe even have your uh, your artist name have a bracket name with your name <laughs> <laughs> and the album uh, will just yeah. be called brackets it should, it should be called eddie sparks the green screen metal guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go uh, yeah. What, what have we got here now? We got uh, it's all right. Like, oh yeah, my god, song. the quality of the songs on here is immense. Hold me, touch me, think of me when we're apart. The other is bracket track. <laughs> you know, it it's nice. I like it. Uh, Love in chains, hard rocking track. So it sounds like a damn good straight up kiss track, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And goodbye. Closing out a fantastic record with one more banger. This is just banger central, dude. Yeah. This album, this next to Unmasked, underrated as fuck, dude. Agreed, agreed. Like, damn. I was so taken aback by it, considering the fact that I've I'd never given it its fair share of attention up until we did this ranking. And it breached the top five of my list. Yeah. So... If you haven't listened to this one, listen to it. It's an extra excellent Kiss record that you've not heard. Yeah, it's you know, it's it is it's it's fantastic. I just I, I don't know. I'm with you. Like I, it's one of those ones where it's like this this could have been your number one, and I would have been like, yep, cool, fine with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's the thing. It's just so fucking good, and I'm glad that we included the solo albums because. Yeah. They were marketed as Kiss albums, so they're Kiss albums. It even says Kiss on the cover, so I'm inclined to call them that. I mean, even I, if I think they it's, are technically... it's it's under the Kiss umbrella, meaning you know their management had some say. So you know, mm. it's because it, Kiss at that point was a business already, and um, yeah. So <laughs> you know, it's you can you can say that they're they're each member's unique voices, but I'm pretty sure there was an overarching presence of somebody being like, yes, this is what it must sound like or something like that. Anyway. Yeah, man. Cool. Paul Stanley. I, I, I love that album and um, I already talked about it, but we're getting into my top five now. My, and uh, my number five is also an album that you spoke about last episode, um, which Ooh. I thought was, was too low for this album as well. Uh, my number five is Rock and Roll Over from 1976. Um, one of two albums that Kiss released in 1976. Um, two of their best came out in 1976, in my opinion. And this was one where 
they kind of tried to go back to a more straightforward rock and sound because they they uh, they were a little ambitious with uh, Destroyer. Um, obviously, yeah. we'll get to that one for both of us. We have not talked about that one yet. But Rock and Roll Over is so good from beginning to end. Every song on this album is great. And it's got some of my favorites. Like Take Me is one of my favorite Kiss songs. And I think I just like the... I, I don't know the. It, it, there's something about it. It just, it, it just, <laughs> it just works for me. And it's got that great line: "Put your hand in my pocket and grab onto my rocket." Is the first, uh, <laughs> first line that you hear. And um, I just noticed that we're not, we're not doing any singing today, and and I'm gonna chalk that up to my allergies, and and you apparently concussing yourself earlier today with your yeah. car door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, just, just for the listeners, I, uh, was in a bit of a hurry to get to work this morning. I woke up a little bit late and in my un coffee fueled. So I, 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 was, I didn't have the focus I would have on, on my normal morning. I hadn't had, I hadn't had my coffee and, uh, yeah, climbing into my car in a rush, I slammed the side of my head directly into the roof yep. of my fucking car and uh i've been pretty dizzy for the rest of the day so so yeah. so don't go to sleep tonight okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and yeah and i've got crazy allergies going on over here in in texas i don't know it's 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 it, it, it's rough on me sometimes but um, but yeah, th- this album is filled with songs that I will happily sing along to at any time. Just the begin, just "I Want You" as an opener is so fucking good. Calling Doctor Love, um, fucking uh, hard luck woman. If never oh, I man. had you, oh, I man, gotta God. say that's, that's all the singing you're gonna get. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, dude, if if it wasn't, for I said the I was gonna do that... the whole song, and I feel like I'm shortchanging sure everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I I just gotta say that it, now that I I hear these songs from Rock and Roll Over, the sole reason that th- the some of these classic seventies records are so low down is because I love some of the eighties albums so much, yeah. and it's it, I will say there is, with the notable exception of like one in my top pick i don't think i've actually got any uh, yeah aside from unmasked which really isn't the quote-unquote 80s kiss yeah it's still it's still got the original vibe you know there are it's just so fucking hard to pick between the two eras because it's like it's like deciding between two bands at that point yeah no because there's just i totally there's so many there's so many good ones yeah and i'd say I would say, to be honest, you know, everything, uh, the first, the second two episodes we did, the the last one and this one, love Mm. pretty much all of them. But yeah, Yeah. it's so fucking hard to pick all these great albums, man. Hell yeah. Rock rock and Roll Over is so good. It's great. And the interesting thing about it, just because we talk about this a lot, um, there is no Ace Frehley song on Rock and Roll Over. And um, so not, not not only does he not sing on it because he didn't start singing until Love Gun, but um, there's no Ace Frehley written song on Rock and Roll Over, which is interesting because they go back to being more straightforward rock and yet Ace is not present. That could be why then I, it, it's a little lower down for me. It's just lacking a little bit of that Ace yeah. action. But I just love, I don't know, for some reason, like the especially Hard Luck Woman, I know it's a very non-Kiss sounding song. But, but it's so good. It, it carries so much weight for me that I, I love this album. But I just love, I love everything about it. It's a very straightforward, fun album. And it feels like an album made by a band who are like, they're, they're riding high on their own success and their own hype. And they're just like, you know, it, the momentum is just making them produce these amazing songs in this amazing album and it just feels like a real confident band which they at this point they had to be because they were they they had now blown up massively at this point and even honestly even the songs in this album that are a little bit weaker they're still super fun um really you could say that about all of the kiss albums because they're to an unpopular opinion well this might be actually a popular opinion 
there is no Kiss album without a weak track. There's no perfect Kiss album. There yeah. are there are a lot of really great Kiss albums, but every single one of them, even my number one, I could point a, out a song and go, that that one's not quite as good <laughs> as the yeah. as the other ones. But um, yeah, Rock and Roll Over is just it's it's just a lot of fun. I love the album cover too, and um, it's that's a, it's almost become like that's like a real classic Kiss image. Not not so much a, a, as classic as like Destroyer would become, but um, I just lo- I love the design of it all, and I guess it's I said the same thing about uh, Crazy Nights, where I like the fact that you can take the LP cover and you can turn it around and you can see it yeah. see it right way up each way you go. But anyway, I don't have a lot to add for Rock and Roll Over besides that. It's just uh, it's just a fucking fun '70s rock album, and I love it. So it's my number uh, five. Hell yeah. Um, all right, so we so we're now on to our top four of the, right the kiss. Man, we're getting we're getting there. We're getting to the end here. Oh, man, it's just, these these albums they're just so good. This is a total gush fest over here. Absolutely. Um, so my number four, I've got Ace Frehley. All right. So it's tied for the best the the two best solo albums. Uh, right next to Paul Stanley, uh, but it did have a little bit of a heavy edge to it that tipped it over the edge for me. That was kind of like, yeah, yeah, this one it has that the badass factor just a little bit higher. So rip it out. I wish Ace had more time to shine vocally on early Kiss records. I love his approach to the sound. Yeah, you know, speeding back to my baby is something I wish I could do. If we weren't in a pandemic, <laughs> <laughs> but um, serious, serious oh, tune man. though. Yeah, it is. It's so fucking good. Snowblind has a really cool, heavy Shit, feel, man. Yeah, that, yeah. God, that song rules. It's like it, it's like Sabbath, but with a sharper production sound. Yeah. To, to me, like da 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 snow blast so fucking good i I really think that with this particular album it's for me the combination of ace and anton fig on drums because i think anton fig has a similar quality to ace where they both feel like they're just natural badasses and they're not trying to be too flashy but the groove feels so good on this album with the with the drums and the and everything else but yeah, and then you can hear it a lot on on this song. That's the thing, and music like this makes me feel better about not really being too much of a flashy drummer myself because yeah. like I I can do like fast things, but it's more physically demanding than, you know, rudiments and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm not I've got a few chops, but I'm not the flashiest player at, ever at all. But I can hold down a pretty morbidly obese groove if you ask me to <laughs> you know <laughs> and that's uh, that's what i i think the key is here is is feel over flash you know I, I, that's that's exactly right I, I i agree with that and it pays off because it has a great vibe throughout you know ozone got that real vibey mm, bluesy yeah. thing going on real laid back into it uh, what's on your mind? Rocking track, further add into the strength of this record. New York Groove, great cover, really catchy, yeah. infectiously fun. I'm in need of love. Ace is just doing his thing, wiped out, pretty damn heavy groover. And then Fractured Mirror is this cool instrumental to close out what I believe to be the best of the 78 solo albums by, by just, far but yeah yeah it's, it's yeah an amazing record um yeah i i look at that album cover and i think yeah this lives up to that fucking spaceman thing because this is out of this fucking world hell yeah good it's yeah ki- it's a killer album and so killer that it is not my number four <laughs> hey <laughs> we're not getting there yet <laughs> Um, with my number four, I've decided to go with the um, the debut album Kiss from 1970. Was it three? Nice. 74. 1974. Yeah. And this is just classic. It, it, honestly, we're we're in to 
what I considered like unfuck withable territory. Um, yeah. Like I said, they don't have a perfect album, but I I think that my top four are four albums that I think are probably on a lot of people's top <laughs> tops. Yeah, <laughs> um, because they're just, it's it, they're undeniably great, and especially this one as a debut album, just the literally the first half of the album strutter into nothing to lose into firehouse into cold gin and to let me know which let me know yeah. is this is a song that like i don't think it's as great as the previous four but it wraps up with that badass ending which which later on in concerts they would only play that part of this song they wouldn't play the rest of it they would just tag that on to other things and but i mean just just the begin just strutter on its own is a really great introduction to kiss and then they follow it up with nothing to lose which is a song about convincing your woman to have anal sex and <laughs> right out of the gate and and, the, and when once you once you realize that that's what the song about when you have the lyrics <laughs> like she didn't want to do it but she did anyway <laughs> it just i'm like god damn right out of the gate <laughs> they're just like they're pulling no punches, but hell yeah. Um, and then like, it, it, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously from that point on, we move into Firehouse, which is just which is a, a classic one. Which which Firehouse would become um, a song that was famous for. That's when Gene would blow the fire, you know, in that part yeah. of the concert. And then you skip a little bit later, and you have a um, hundred thousand years which is the song where Gene would spit up blood in the beginning during the bass part, do -do 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 -do, yeah. and he would be vomiting the blood everywhere. So that's <laughs> there's just so much, not just classic songs, but who Kiss are as a band yeah. and a live act is so much tied to this album. That that's like a mission statement. Ex exactly. And it's almost like yeah. if, if, if in somebody else's list, if this is number one, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I absolutely understand this being somebody's favorite, or they think this is the best, even with Kiss in Time, which Kiss in Time wasn't on the original um, release, but yeah. I think very quickly it was added on. I don't. I, I think it's just like maybe First Press didn't have Kiss in Time, which is a cover song, but it's cute, I guess. Yeah. You know? But it doesn't add anything <laughs> to the album at all. But then you get right into Deuce, which Deuce is one of the best Kiss oh, songs. Man. Um, and of course, you wrap it up with Black Diamond, which, which was a show closer, I think, for a while. And it's and it just it, and it's um, one of the best Peter Chris vocals, I think, also in uh, in Black Diamond. But um, I love know, how it slows down at the end too, where yeah. it goes into like borderline doom metal territory. Yeah. And yeah, that's I know an interesting idea there. It's just it, I know they're just slowing the whole mix down on the tape. But there's just something so crushing about it slowly going down. Well, just the just the fact that they down. don't they could have just faded it out. But the fact that they yeah. let it go for so long, getting slower and slower, I'm always like, holy shit, man, that's <laughs> that's an idea. Like in the studio, where they're just like, fuck it, just do it. It's the end of the album. Who cares? Yeah. But it's it's an interesting thing. Like I've always, eventually, we'll get to um, Black Sabbath. But um, one of my biggest gripes about Black Sabbath is I don't understand why the end of War Pigs is sped up. Because, because, like, because yeah. literally there's only like 30 seconds of the song left. Why did they need to do that? They, they, <laughs> the, the album isn't so long that it wouldn't fit on the vinyl. There is no yeah. reason to do that. Where in the case of, of this, I feel like it adds like a real heavy and ominous kind of ending to this album. And... I don't know. It's just it's one of one of the best debut albums ever, in my opinion. It's just uh, um, it's just a classic. It's a Stone Cold classic, and it's and in hindsight, you know, because I wasn't alive when this album came out, but when I first started to really get into Kiss and learn about their history, it blew my mind that they weren't popular right out of the gate with this album. Yeah. And because it it makes no sense because it's just like shit. This shit is amazing. But I mean, to be fair. All these other great bands that came out in the '70s, you know, I always talk about Aerosmith, um, but you know, Rush, like who, you name it, none of them were big right out of the gate. They they had mm. they had a couple albums and then they worked their way up. So I guess it makes sense. But 
out of all of those bands that I'm that I'm just named, like you know, you named some seventies bands. I think the Kiss debut is better than most of those bands' debut albums. And um, really, really strong, yeah. So yeah, so that's why it is is my number four, the debut album from Kiss from nineteen seventy four. I don't know why I'm talking like that. It feels good. Though. <laughs> I saw a really funny thing recently. It's a live clip of the band on stage. I think it's a pretty recent one. It's like at least the last you know kind of 15 years um and there's a bit of stage rigging that catches fire and they look up at it and they pull the camera over to it and they're like okay guys don't panic we've got the guy coming over to put it out with the extinguisher they lower this like bit of stage rigging and start playing firehouse <laughs> while they <laughs> extinguish it and it's one of the funniest fucking things because everybody's like we should be panicking but this is fucking cool so that was it wasn't part of the show they it wasn't pull, part of the show they didn't they didn't pull a metallica where they try to act like shit's going wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, th- I think it was like a, a light just caught fire up in the up in the stage rigging That's and they were like pretty awesome yeah they were like we can't let that spread let's bring that down and play firehouse where they put it out <laughs> Man, i love especially if you if you ever get to see or if you have seen the the kissology dvds which i wish that they would put those out like digitally for me to just have like yeah. on apple tv or whatever because i love them especially there's some footage from a really early concerts around the time of the first couple albums and just that's one thing that I have to say. I, I, we've talked about it a little bit, but I hear people occasionally say that Kiss couldn't really play their instruments. And I'm just like, that's the fucking stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. <laughs> now, were they as good at playing their instruments as the other bands that were popular in the 70s? Not really, no. But them as a live band, the energy, the interplay, the the vibe of their live show and how they sounded, they were so fucking good. Yeah. And if like right from the beginning, I mean I realized that, you know, they had experience especially Gene and Paul already being in bands and stuff, but um I just I I I it's one of those things where I just feel like if anyone that says that hasn't seen that old footage and that they were a fucking great rock band. I mean they still are to a different degree, but you know, they were just a fucking fantastic rock band. And, um, yeah, I love that old, I love seeing the old concert footage of them. I really want, yeah. If anybody from kiss, the kiss camp listens to this, which they won't, but, um, (laughs) please put the kissology collections on somewhere for me to purchase, to watch them streaming. Cause I, um, I don't re- I don't have a DVD player. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I, as much as I love old school shit, when it comes to technology, I am already in the future. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm all, I'm all about that shit anyway. So yeah, so let's, let's move on to your number three. Okay. So my number three is possibly the most controversial placement in my entire list. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Number three. And this totally makes sense coming from me. Oh, my God. I just realized one we haven't talked about yet. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so my number three is Crazy Nights. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I don't hate this at all. I love this. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is, this is my, you know, 80s personality condensed into a disc. And, yeah, yeah this is like my ideal sounding album you know if i was going to make an album i'd be quite happy for it to sound like this <laughs> you know it and you know crazy crazy nights first kiss song i ever heard i used to listen to that 80s compilation album mm-hmm. in the passenger seat in my mum's car as she drive me back from judo lessons because i recently watched the karate kid and i was really into 80s movies as a kid too so, so that's quick quick side note though the song crazy crazy nights reminds me of and this is a, this is a weird connection but it, but if you've ever heard this album before you'll know what i'm talking about in i believe it was the early 90s i'm not sure exactly what year it was but um there was a popular children's cartoon and toy line and if you went to pizza hut and paid $5, you would get an album by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
Oh, uh, dude. Called Coming Out of Their Shells. And yeah. it's got, you. if you haven't heard it, look it up on YouTube because you will love it. It is Montage okay. Central by a, ba- a group of, because they literally did a fucking tour. They had people dressed up as the Ninja Turtles doing a rock concert tour. I think and- I remember seeing like clips of that on YouTube. I think there's like a, a there's a fucking Oprah interview with them. It's there, fucking there might ace. there very well might be. But there's a couple songs like one that comes to mind is there's one called Count on Us and it's like we're the turtles. You can count on us. Like it's and it's sound, and it reminds me of like Crazy Nights era Kiss. Like it's got that big anthemic quality to it. But I'm um, going to need to get this album, dude. Yeah, I, I, I think I you already can, fucking love it. I think it's only available on cassette, but you can. But the whole album is on YouTube. Even better. <laughs> you know oh what? Now that now, now that we're talking about this, I, after we get done with this, I'm going to go fucking order that thing for myself because it's been such a Hell long time. Yeah. But I do know I do know the full album is on YouTube. But you it, you will be a fan, and you you'll wish that you could go see the Turtles in concert, which I didn't get to go. <laughs> But I oh, fucking, man. it's so funny because this was the early nineties where I was listening to metal, but I did not yeah. give two shits about talking about how much I thought the turtles album was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> I'm pretty sure as well. There's like a, there's like a accompanying documentary yes. slash concert yes. film. There of is, it. there and is. Isn't there a scene in it where they're explaining how they play their instruments to the kids? And it's like, well, I found this thing called drop D tuning. I, I, and essentially <laughs> it allows me to play with my turtle hand. I, I don't know if I don't remember that for sure. But um, <laughs> I'm telling so you that cool. there's, prob- there's probably a good you know worm- wormhole for you to go down with just looking up turtle live <laughs> rock band stuff. Because it's... Uh, it's pretty awesome. Anyway, I just had to I had to do that tangent because I, I immediately thought to myself, if Eddie doesn't know that album, he needs to have it in his life. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to I've, Crazy Nights. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It, I'll fight hell to hold you. Keyboard latent 80s pop metal is something I live for. So I like this record and you got, a lot. And on that song, you got Paul Stanley way up there. I found like he's like yeah know, man way the hell up there I, there's a little bit of singing for you folks you're welcome there this is a very paul stanley album mm-hmm. this could easily you know how how we mentioned earlier how paul stanley would have gone off and done his own thing mm-hmm. had kiss not stayed together this is probably what it would have sounded like oh i think he did do a, a solo album was it in the 80s and oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know it very well. Um, I think I've heard it once, and so I don't know. Maybe, maybe now that we're doing this, I need to go and like actually listen to his solo stuff. But oh, never mind. He didn't do a solo album until two thousand six. So never mind. Damn. So anyway, back to Crazy Nights. <laughs> yeah, man. Then you got Bang Bang You, Silly, and that's why I like yeah. it. Yeah. You know, No 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 has a Hot for Teacher vibe. This sounds like the album could have been done by Danger Danger. Featuring Naughty yeah. Naughty and Bang Bang. <laughs> and no, no, and no, no, no. no, no. They, they, they got a triple. They got a triple in there. I don't know which uh. song it is on this album, but um, there's a thing that all these 80s bands would do in at least one song where they would use old, like, children's schoolyard sayings. And so there's literally a Kiss song where it's like, yeah. Liar, liar, got your pants on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed like every band did that. Like somewhere in their songs, they had some weird childish thing that they incorporated into their lyrics. The big one that sticks out to me is uh, Play With Me by Extreme. That one's like a... What does, uh, he, what does he say in that one? Oh, uh, that one's just like, it just has a bunch of references to like playground games. Oh, is that the one from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? It is the one from Bill and Ted's okay. Excellent Adventure. Oh, which you're, wearing, wearing, you're sporting the shirt. I'm sporting the shirt right now. Have you seen Bill and Ted face the music yet? I have not. I, it's, it's a criminal offense that I have yet to face charges for. Whenever <laughs> you decide to watch it, let me know, because I, I need to watch it again to really solidify my opinion, so maybe then we can talk about it. Because I, I, I watched it, and I decided I'm going to wait a little bit and then watch it again. So Cool. I will, uh, I'll actually, it, I'll look it up on iTunes and probably buy it there. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, where, where was I at? Oh, Hello High Water, really catchy tune. Now, I gotta say, right, I looked up 
like it's someone out there ranked every Kiss song, all two hundred and nineteen, ranked every single one. That that and sounds put, exhausting. And put <laughs> my way at the fucking bottom, and I have to say, I dead fucking wrong, dude. I, I don't know. That's the che- cheesiest Kiss song there is. <laughs> it's just, but, but the keyboards are pretty epic on that. Like it's, but it does have a. It does the keyboard has that sound like it should be a song that's in like a training video for NASA <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something like that from the eighties. Just like a, it, in a fucking iron Eagle scene or some yeah, shit. Like, there you go, <laughs> dude. That's exactly why I love it because I heard, <laughs> I heard it and I thought to myself, is this in my montage playlist? I looked it up. Wasn't in the playlist. I thought, why the fuck is it not there, dude? That's like, I, why is this whole album not in that playlist? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> like, I think, you know, there's just something about montage music that does it for me, man. And this song, cheesy as all hell, but you can't beat cheese in the montage. You know, it needs to have that layer of, of synth and ridiculousness. Cheese is a make... very important ingredient in the montage song. Exactly. You know? It's it's also it go, also goes well in the uh, glam sandwich you mentioned. <laughs> <It> totally does. <laughs> Coming soon from Eddie Sparks. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man, when your walls come down, standard eighties hard rocker, and then you get reason to live. Oh, one man. of my favorite. Everybody one of my favorite. Reason to reason live. To live. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's oh, got man. a dream. Oh, I'm going to do do That's a, that an epic song right there. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. It's it's one of my favorite power ballads of all time. At least top five. Yeah. Oh, good Girl Gone Bad. Smooth and suave sounding. Turn on the Night. I love. It's just such a party song. That is also a big montage sounding song too. Turn on the yeah. Night. Yeah. My Way and Turn on the Night are kind of like, you know, brothers in arms when it comes to the montage thing going on here yeah. but that just adds to to what we mentioned previously about it being like it actually feels like the soundtrack for an 80s movie that doesn't exist yeah like and i kind of want to make that movie around this album <laughs> and just <laughs> find a way to shoehorn it in but maybe, um, maybe we should start we should do a petition to have them do a a rock of ages style musical where they just write something around crazy nights and make a story yeah. out of it. I mean, there'll be you know ten people will want to see it, but two of them will be us, <laughs> <laughs> and the other eight are just extra accounts I've made to fund it. <laughs> Change dot org. It will get a petition going. Make the crazy nights musical. Fuck all the fuck all this political shit. This is the important stuff. <laughs> it's just like a dejected Paul Stanley walks down the road and he's just like had something horrible happen. And he's like, I'm going to walk like I walk, talk like I talk <laughs> my way. I, I, I see it. I can see it already. Man, this sounds move over Hamilton. We got the, the new hot musical coming your way. Totally. It has to happen now. We've, we've got too good an idea. Oh, and then finally, Thief in the Night, that riff is pure 80s metal goodness. You know, I, I got to say, I, is it the heaviest song on the album? I think it is. Probably. It's, I mean, that's it, hard. That's hard to tell. There's a, this is a pretty light album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think like what's I say, the one? Yeah. I think I'd probably go with uh, No, No, No. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. It, that's the thing, though. It's like if Gene's on the mic, then it's going to. It's always going to be that that step up. It is a light album, but it feels really fun. That's the thing about this album. Yeah, it's light but real fun, and that's big what eight, I love about 80s it. Big eighties awesomeness, or, or 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 like like you said on the last one, eighties hard it, rock eight, done in a fuck yeah way. Fuck yeah way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, just just fists pumping in the air and driving a Trans Am through the Mojave Desert. Flowing. 
<laughs> but yeah, that that is my number three, my extremely controversial number three. To be completely honest, if if Crazy Nights wasn't in your top five, I would call for a do over for this entire podcast. I'd just be like, <laughs> something is wrong with Eddie. Maybe he hit his head too hard. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, so my number three, we're good. We're going completely opposite for me, um, but. This is this was tough ranking these three albums because they all have qualities that could put them on the top for me. But uh, my number three Kiss album is Destroyer from 1976. Wow. And this is an interesting album to me because I think at the time... Some people didn't like it because it was kind of glossy and overproduced and they're flirting with these different styles that are not so rock, you know, with songs like Beth and stuff like that. Yeah. But the thing that makes this one of the best Kiss albums for me um, is the fact that they went big. Like yeah. they just tried to be as ambitious as they could possibly be with this album and it makes it so much fun all the way through. Not only the fact, not aside from the fact that you have, when it comes to just rock songs, some of their best songs, like Detroit Rock City is one of the best Kiss songs, even though it has, I don't understand why there's the big extended intro with sound effects of a guy getting ready for work and getting into his car or something. It's just, it's a whole lot of sound effects for nothing really going on. Like you could, they could have just started it with a dude getting into his car and driving, but it's, it's really I weird. Think, I think it's to do with, cause isn't it about a kiss fan that died on his way to a kiss concert? I believe so, but I, I don't know. Even it's, it's always very weird to me. I always kind of go, they should have just lopped off the beginning of this and just gone. Cause the, you put the needle down in your, I mean, that would have been cool, but I yeah. mean, it is what it Maybe is. Maybe had like some, Maybe it had some like engine revving, yeah, like, or that, yeah. But also, but that kind of thing. But I chalk it up to them just being ambitious with this album, and they were like, hey, "Of course, we're going to have an extended sa uh, sound effect intro." And then Detroit Rock City into King of the Nighttime World is fucking great. Yeah, it is. It's a great song, but just that song leading into that next song is just it's this. This album is. You see why it's a fucking classic. And then you get God of Thunder right after that. It's just so much great yeah. shit. And then you get the song on the album that I don't know if I love it or hate it. And that's what makes it brilliant. Great expectations. It is yeah. it when this is probably the point on the album where somebody who was a KISS fan and liked the rock and stuff would go, What? is this because it's, <laughs> it's weird. There's like a boys choir in it. There's, and it's Gene singing some really creepy stuff about how yeah. you see what my fingers can do. And you wish yeah. that you were the one I was doing it to. And I'm just like, <laughs> Oh my God. It's, and then, but, but then when it gets to the chorus that you've got great expectations, I, I giggle at that every time that comes up. I'm yeah. like, okay, I now I love this song because it's so just like who the fuck would come up with this song and decide to just put it on the Kiss album and I'm like that's why this album is great because he brought <laughs> he brought in that song and the other three guys didn't go no <laughs> like I, I just I just I just find it so fucking weird that there's you know a boys choir in a song with really fucking sexual lyrics like yeah. you're sitting in your seat. And then you stand and clutch your breasts. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like what? Oh god! You know how I mentioned the fucking Alive Four concert? Yeah, they have an actual like school choir come up on stage for that song. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, it's awesome to see, but it's it's just kind of like whenever I hear him say the lyrics, it's like, oh, man. But it, it's just so uh, funny how, how a song can give me such whiplash where I go from cringing to giggling, <laughs> like, right? It's just like, and there's something, so, there, so there's the fact that it's that, it almost, it almost makes me feel like, you know, like sometimes there's those movies that are like critically acclaimed, but they're really hard to watch. 
Like yeah. is there, the, the subject matter is weird or it's just a real, I don't know. Like what's that, what's that one, the Adam Sandler movie that just came out, everyone loved. And it was just a, it was just a fucking knuckle, white knuckle movie from beginning to end. Um, uh, um, I don't remember what it was. Uncut Gems? Uncut is that Gems, the name of yeah, it? yeah. And so it's almost like occasionally there's those songs that because of the awkwardness of it, it's genius. And so I think <laughs> yeah. that... I think that at Great Expectations is that. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm almost doing a track by track here, which is very unlike me. So we'll, we'll, so we'll skip on, though, because uh, you get later on in the album, and obviously you got Shout It Out Loud, which is um, a classic song. Also, Hell yeah. also a very important song to me because it was one of my daughter's first favorite songs when she was like two. When she was first starting to hear music to where she could talk to me about how she wanted to hear certain songs. Shout it yeah. out loud was one of the songs that she always wanted to listen to. So it's got that connection for me. But um, and then Beth, Beth is a classic song. It's very unkissed, um, but it's okay, it's just, it's a fucking great song. Uh, and do you love me? Do you love me is a really cool song to, to me as well. But I also love it because Nirvana did a cover of Do You Love Me, and I've always really enjoyed their cover just because of of uh, Chris Novoselic doing his his weird Paul impersonation at the end of the song. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it makes me laugh every time, but it's, so it's just like, this is a, it's got such a good variety of songs. It's really ambitious, but at the same time, it is utterly enjoyable from beginning to end. And what more could you ask for in a fucking kiss album? Like it's, it's, it does have its flaws but I almost feel like the flaws in this album add up to why it's so much fun to listen to. I don't, I don't want this album to be perfect because it's, it's awkwardness at times is what makes it great. And along with the actual greatness of some of the songs. So, um, once again, this is another album that if somebody put it as their number one, I wouldn't even bat an eyelash. I would just be like, yeah, cool. I, I absolutely get it. I feel like it's their most, it's the album that if, if somebody's coming in to kiss for the first time, I feel like this is the one everyone says, yeah, just start with Destroyer. But, yeah. Um, Which is funny because like in relation to a lot of the other 70s kiss, it's got a hell of a lot of difference to a lot of it, you know, which is why it, I love um, it. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's such a big production compared to like the first three pretty gritty and down to earth. Yeah. And it's like, and, and not only that, it's got the, it's got the most iconic album cover, I believe of any kiss album, Yeah, but it just, it really just feels like an album from a band that has finally arrived. Like we talked about rock and roll over sounds like a band that's, they have some momentum and they're still on their way to the top. Destroyer sounds like an album from a band on the top. And so it has to yeah. be big. Absolutely has to be big. And and it's not their most ambitious. I would go for uh, music from the elder for that one. But um yeah. but this is a close second. And um I just I, I like albums like this. I don't I don't want I wouldn't want Kiss to, you know, if I was in if, if it was if it was Steven now back in 1976, I would not want them to put out another album like their first three. So I would have been all over this fucking album. And I, and so I am now today, my number three destroyer. Awesome. So my number two is the 1974 debut. Nice. So here's, here's my, here's my San Andreas plug. Strutter is, <laughs> Strutter is a great song and is on the KDST radio station in GTA San Andreas. Awesome. Fucking awesome song. And it introduced me to 70s Kiss. I knew about 80s Kiss and I knew about 70s Kiss, but it this is the song that made me think, fuck, this is good. I need to listen to this whole album. And I made a good move buying, you know, the, the first Kiss album because... It is, like we said, a, a real mission statement for what they're about. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing to Lose has a real old school rock and roll vibe. It even got some like wild piano in the background. Mm -hmm. Firehouse has an awesome groove to it. So far, three bangers in a row. You know, cold gin, cold gin time again. Yeah. So, and just this laid back groover that I love. 
Gene's time to shine as vocalist on this one, though. I, re- like, I really, I really do like hearing um, Ace Frehley do this song, like when he did like Frehley's Comet and shit. Um, yeah, I really do like hearing Ace sing this song because it it, fe- it feels even with Gene sing- singing it, you can still feel that it's an Ace Frehley song. Yeah, for sure. Like and like you say, let me know was mm. my least favorite so far, but redeemed itself by having the coolest outro riff. Yeah. Pretty great. Every time I see Let Me Know, I just have to do that riff. Yeah. Um, Kiss and Time has some cool drumming <laughs> from Peter Chris. Really cool choices of rhythms, you know, per section. Um, Deuce is a great track. Love the Alive version as well. Mm-hmm. But there's something cool I noticed. I don't know if you picked up on it, but the big guitar bend after the first chorus gives me 10 era Pearl Jam vibes for some reason. It reminds me of the porch solo where it's like, like that really slow bend. I mean, I'm pretty sure that they're Kiss fans. Like I, like I said, like I said before, I think any band that's worth a damn, somebody in that band is a Kiss fan. For sure. Um, I, I, I think I've seen Mike McCready in kiss makeup or something. I can't, I don't know if I've seen like a photo. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but uh, what else have we got? Love theme from kiss is an instrumental. It's got some cool moments in it. And I love that they say love theme from <laughs> kiss, Yeah, you know, as if to say, yeah, we're going to be one of those huge bands that, you know, makes a fucking movie and, and they did love it. They did. Yeah. It didn't turn out so well, but they, they made it. <laughs> <laughs> have you watched that? Like, I know you've seen the whole movie, but have you seen that video on YouTube where it's just all of the kiss dialogue in one place? No, but and that it's sounds, just, that sounds great. Oh man, it's just hilarity. Oh, a hundred thousand years is fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. And Black Diamond, the epic closing track. I gotta say, you know, they, like I said, they were way ahead of the curve when it came to the brutal breakdown thing. The ending is one of the heaviest things. Like yeah. it's so sli- it's so so simple. But slowing the whole mix down sounds gnarly. And I know they didn't do that live because they just kept hitting the chord and yeah. and peter peter would rise into the air oh and yeah like, yeah that's when his drum kit would rise up yeah yeah but it's it sounds so cool on the album and it must have scared the shit out of like listeners back when it came out because it was like oh shit i've listened to this badass rock and roll album and you know there's a demon on the front of it yeah and now <laughs> now i've probably opened a fucking portal to something in the house now i've got to go check that out but yeah this album rules it rules absolutely um yeah man we're just we're just in some fucking classic territory here at this point um it's like i love what you said unfuck withable yeah it's so true and um and so this is interesting so my number two um when we first said we're gonna do a kiss album ranking in my notebook i wrote down kiss and i wrote down number one and I wrote this album title and, and, and I knew, I knew that I, I go, this probably won't end up being my number one because I have to be, I have to look at this from a more objective standpoint and not just how I feel. <laughs> so my number two out of all of these albums, it's my favorite, but I put it at number two because like we talked about earlier, this is some of the albums are under the Kiss umbrella, but some albums are legit Kiss albums. So my number two album is the Ace Frehley solo album. Hey, but don't get me wrong, it is my favorite out of all these albums. This is not only is it my favorite out of all these albums, it is one of my favorite albums ever made. I can't get enough of listening to this album. It's really like nothing but great songs and great performances. We talked about this a little bit, just the interplay between Ace Fraley and Anton Fig on this. Um, and you know, they, there's other musicians here and there on it as well, but um, it it's just, it feels like the most honest rock and roll album made by somebody who is just gifted at 
making Being a badass. badass. Yeah, making badass music. And the, and one of my favorite things, especially when you're talking about songs like Snowblind and Ozone and Wiped Out, they we I think yeah. I said this before on another episode, but Ace Frehley is really good at coming up with riffs that aren't difficult to play, but don't sound like things that you've already heard. Like he does some sort of weird inverted thing sometimes with his songwriting and his riff writing where you just go, Oh, that's, I never, that's interesting. But if you picked up a guitar, you could learn the song in like five minutes. And it's no, not a fucking big deal, but um, it's just, his whole vibe is so cool. Like, it's just like, there's a reason why he's my favorite kiss member. And it's because he just came across as the coolest fucking dude. And in the songs that he wrote, he, that also comes across. It's he's like he's like the the Fonzie of Kiss. Like he just walks into yeah. a room and, and bang, bangs on the on the jukebox <laughs> and it every you know it's like he walks into a room and everyone applauds because the cool dude has walked into the fucking room and that's <laughs> that's what the Ace Frehley solo album is. It's like this really cool fucking album and I love honestly. It's just also it's like you know thirty thirty five thirty six minutes long and it's it's a it's an album that's easily one of those ones where. I would just flip it right back over to side A and then play it again as soon as it's over. And like I said, there's no Kiss album without weak tracks. Um, I'd probably say in this case, uh, What's On Your Mind is probably the weakest on this album, but it's still really yeah. fucking good. And I love New York Groove. New, uh, New York Groove, I guess, in a, in a way, it does differ from a lot of the other stuff on this album. But even then, he took this song and made it just... I don't, it made it cool. There's no other way to fucking put it. It just feels like the coolest fucking record ever made. And I love the way it sounds. I love the production. It's, you know, Eddie Kramer on this, which Eddie Kramer produced. We could probably do, we should do an episode of our top five Eddie Kramer produced albums because he did a lot of really good shit. 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, I, think he, I think even as an engineer, like he goes all the way back to the 60s. And so, um, but yeah, the album sounds amazing. I love the album cover just because I think I liked, you know, Ace's makeup the best. And um, yeah. it's just, yeah, this was a, this was a, a, a rough one for me because I, I really do listen to this album more than any other Kiss related album. But at the end of the day, it is just an Ace Fraley album. It does say Kiss on it. So I had to be fair and I had to say, this is my favorite of these albums, but what is actually my favorite Kiss album? And that's what we'll get to when we get to my number one. But my number two is the Ace Frehley solo album, which just fucking rules from beginning to end. Yeah, agreed. So, my number one. Do it. I had to go with Destroyer. Awesome. Destroyer is... is even with its weak points, like we say, they never made a a perfect album, but fuck, this is good. The parts where it shines, shine incredibly bright. Yeah. Like, Detroit Rock City, iconic opener, so fucking cool. Also, one time, I have a fun little story here, it's just a little quick one. All right. Also, one time, the tire screech at the end of the song <laughs> scared the shit out of my girlfriend because she thought I'd lost control of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I, had the, I had the stereo loud, too. I was like, oh, hey, look, I've got it on shuffle and it's Detroit Rock City. I can't not have this loud. She was like, okay. And then, like, by the end of the song, I was on a roundabout as well. Yeah. This is a... This is a British problem. I think it was like a nasty one too. You get some roundabouts when nobody actually knows what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so I get onto this roundabout and I start pulling away and she hears this screech and she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> she, 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 she goes, what the fuck, dude? And I said, it's all right. It's only in the song. She was like, scared the shit out of me, dude. That totally reminds uh, me. I have a brief story. It's not kiss related though, but it's related to that where, when I was a kid. I was a little kid. I don't remember how old I was. Probably like ten or something like that. And um, I was on a road trip with my friend's family, and I brought yeah. I brought my my ghetto blaster with me, my 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 big you know portable stereo. And they said I could play whatever I wanted to play, and I because and I was like okay, so I was playing uh, uh, 
Pink, Pink Floyd, The Wall. Nice. There. And I think it's at the end of the very first track. There's a fucking airplane crashing sound effect. Where you hear, oh, shit. You hear, you hear that? And, and my friend's parents freaked the fuck out because they literally thought that an airplane was coming down somewhere around us. And shit. I just remember being like, you can't hear that it's coming from the back seat. Like, like <laughs> you're that on edge that you thought that, that oh, clearly that's an airplane about to crash on top of us. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I've, I, there's, there's some other moments in some songs. I'll have to like, I'll have to think of a few where I've had my like headphones on mm-hmm. and I've just been like walking down the street and, and it's panned in a certain way that makes you think, fuck, a car is going to wipe me out if I don't dive. And then you turn around and there's nothing there. And it's like, ah, oh, okay. It's in the song. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really funny though. They just hear this fucking Stuka sound effect where it's like going in for <laughs> yeah. a dive bomb and, and they're like, fuck, what the hell? That's funny, dude. Yeah. Oh. I, it's, it's, it, but it's it's I you know in, in that in that respect <laughs> I love I love fucking with people when it comes yeah. to m- music so I'm like <laughs> bands should do that more just put the worst sound effects you can think of in your fucking albums just to screw with people be, be like a be like I think Nine Inch Nails did it at one point but also the Melvins did it where they had a CD skipping sound in their song yeah and people would be like but God damn this thing is fucked up man but it was actually just part of the song. There's, oh, which one is it I'm thinking of as well? Didn't the Beatles put like a dog whistle on one of their songs just to fuck with people's pets? They just put like a really high pitched tone at the end of, is it at the end of Abbey Road, I think? No, it's the end of Sgt. Pepper's. That's the where one. Where there's a really, really loud, like, you can, you can, I mean, it's not so loud that you can't hear it. You can actually hear it, the really high tone. But, yeah. um, but that, that's the, that's the explanation was that they did it to fuck with people's dogs, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> You just imagine listening to the Beatles for a nice bit of relaxation, just chilling out, listening to some Beatles, and then right at the end, your dog goes fucking nuts. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he loves this album. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, just cycling back to King of the Nighttime World. King of the Nighttime World is an anthem. There's a very anthemic quality about this album. Yeah. All of the songs are just. They're just fucking anthems. God of Thunder. Gene Simmons utilized perfectly. You know, this is Gene's song. Um, you know, the groove and vibe here is amazing. Mm-hmm. Even with those like cool like kid samples and things like that, you know, it's really creepy and on edge, but also really heavy too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've heard the death cover of this, but it's fucking I, cool. I did at one point, but I don't really remember it offhand. Yeah. Uh it Great expectations. Now, here's my take on it. <laughs> to, to me, before you explained it a little bit, here's what I have in my notes. It's a duff track. I never really liked it. I cringe at pretty much every turn. And yet, this is my favorite Kiss album, which goes to show the sheer strength of everything else here. Because in my wild, one of my wildest twists in Cranked and Ranked history, my favorite album contains my least favorite track <laughs> out of their whole catalog. Yeah. Because it's, I I do know what you mean with like it being gloriously over the top, but it, there's just a certain juxtaposition with how tender it sounds, but at the yeah. same time, Gene is is leaving nothing to the imagination with like the lyrics. Yeah. And like maybe if they were a little bit more sappy, then it would be like, oh, this is just a, a fucking ballad. And I get that Gene is like the creepy uncle of the band, like we've called him. But I feel like but, if, the, if, the, <sighs> if the if the if the verse lyrics were more sappy, then the chorus wouldn't be as funny. You know, yeah, true. I think that that's that's what makes <laughs> you've got great expectations so hilarious to me is all these um, the creepy things he's saying. I'm working on a playlist for a video that I'm I'm cooking up in my head and it's going to be called Eddie Sparks's What the Fuck is Happening uh, playlist. And it's going to be on Spotify and I'm just going to have it laid out. And I'm just going to find all the weirdest, dumbest, and funniest shit that I could just throw into this blended up smoothie of what the hell is going on. That's awesome. Yeah. And 
Like, there's a few... It ranges from everything to, like, Stormtroopers of Death to, like, some weird, obscure interludes from albums and things like that. And it's just going to be one giant, what the hell is going on? But, uh, <laughs> yeah... That's that's something I plan on making in the in the near future. It's gonna it's gonna have it's gonna have when you wish upon a star from Gene Simmons. Oh, there. that has to go in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Flaming Youth is just mm. insanely anthemic and fun. Sweet Pain, kick ass, good time track. Shout it out loud. Another one of those anthems. You know, it's an arena rock gem. Beth, the Peter Chris ballad. It's a it's a beautiful song. You know, sure, yeah. it's a soft ballad with no guitars or anything, but the but piano and strings and stuff. I'll be damned if it ain't a nice song. You know, Peter Chris's voice is, is fitted perfectly to it. And it's a nice change of pace. And then you get, you know, Do You Love Me? And it's just Paul Stanley being a sexy flamboyant bugger for three and a half minutes. Yeah. You know, you like my seven inch leather heels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then you get like rock and roll party slash untitled slash hidden track or whatever you call it is a cool dreamy outro featuring psyched out parts of the record. Now, really, when I boil it down, let's have a look here. One, two, three, seven, eight. OK, so like eight of the 10 tracks are what I would consider Destroyer to really be. Yeah. But, you know. Great expectations. I can live with it being on the record. You know, I'd I'd still buy the record and I'd still let it play. But I don't know. There's there's just something about that one that and there's just a vibe there that's just a little bit too much for me. You know, I can I can appreciate creepy Uncle Gene anywhere else apart from God of Thunder. No, sorry. Apart from Great Expectations. God of Thunder is one of my favorites. That was yeah. a little notes slip up there. I do apologize. But uh yeah, aside from that, fucking amazing album. Awesome. And uh it's funny because my number 1 also has a song on it that I'm like, "Eh, I can, I can do without that one." Um my number 1 is Love Gun from 1977. Oh, wow. Which um it, it, this has been my favorite Kiss album since i was young like it's it's wow. never really changed because i i got into kiss you know when i was around nine i guess and um once i started actually hearing their album albums because i you know got into crazy nights and then i got double platinum and then eventually yeah. um i found because there was a time in the especially early 90s late 80s early 90s where um, people were buying CDs and they were all just selling their records off to like used record stores and bookshops and places like that. So for a while there, I was just going and picking up classic albums for like two bucks, three bucks, you know. And um, Love Gun was one of those. <laughs> yeah, well, Love, Love Gun was one of those. And it that was the first time that I was like, oh, these guys, it's not just the greatest hits kind of band. Like the whole album's fucking cool. And... um Really, it's like like I I said that this is the end of the classic Kiss era for me, and um, really like when you're looking at the songs on here, like Christine Sixteen is not my not the one that I think is weak. Like I still think it's a pretty great song, even if it's a little bit creepy. Yeah, but <laughs> it is. It is a weird. I would have. I think I would have changed the order around a little bit. I would have had I Stole Your Love go into Got Love for Sale because I think that that's. To, that's a killer one-two punch right there. Um, yeah, and then you got shock me by the shock me is just like just the just the first time Ace Frehley shows up and just shows everyone how fucking badass he is. Um, you know, w- without without even trying very hard. But um, it's just this is just for me when it comes to their kiss output. This is the most. It feels the most solid to me where all of the songs feel very well done. And the I love the production on this album. There's no skippers on here for me. I just think that there's a good energy throughout this album. And um, and then, of course, you got Love Gun, which every time I think of Love Gun, I have to quote um, this, the movie Role Models, where he goes, see, his <laughs> dick is the gun. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see Role Models? Oh, man, I, I, need, I need to see that. That's one so, of those... It's it's funny because it's a movie that like it's got a lot of kiss references in it, 
but it's not really about, it's not like Detroit Rock City or anything. It doesn't have a lot to do with Kiss, but it's just <laughs> a really funny movie and it just happens to have a lot of Kiss references in it. Um, but uh, yeah, so obviously Love Gun is about, you know, Paul Stanley's dick, but you know, that who, who did, who didn't know that? <laughs> And then if and then if you didn't get enough dicks on this album, a little bit later you get Plaster Caster, which is literally about a woman <laughs> who makes plaster, you know, representations of men's erect penises. And so <laughs> it's like <laughs> this has got you know it's got all the dicks that you want just on uh, on one album. <laughs> um, but like really, the weak track for me on this album is "Then She Kissed Me," which is I don't I, I almost feel like it was put on here just because they needed a fifth song for side B. And it's not bad. It just seems unnecessary. I would have been perfectly okay if they had just, you know, I mean, ended the album. Well, I guess Plaster Caster is not the best ending in the world. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I really do just, the, the more that I listen to this album, out of all of the Kiss albums, this is the one that ha- it's remained my favorite because I, I always put it on and I always thoroughly enjoy it. There are other Kiss albums that I kind of have to be in the mood for, but Love Gun is one that, I mean, I, I even, I love the album cover of this album and it just really feels like the final collaboration of these original guys and they still had, you know, a lot of juice left in the tank at that point because clearly they had they had the songs and... I don't know. There's, there's aside from just taking out, then she kissed me. There's really nothing I would change about this album because I love all of these songs and they've grown with me over the years, but um, standing back from it and looking at it as an album as a whole, I'm like, yeah, this just album just feels fucking as perfect as kiss. I think we're ever going to get it. And it's just so it's just kind of bittersweet. I guess that it's the last before the band really started to splinter out. Obviously we get their solo albums a year later, but then, you know, it's almost like that was it. I mean, I mean the, in the, the story of kiss, it almost seems appropriate that that's how it ended for the original four. It's like, Oh, we did our solo albums and then through, you know, personality issues or drug abuse or whatever the fuck was going on, you know, the band just started to fall apart. And like I said before, I think their story is more interesting because of that. But I do think that Love Gun was a was a high note, you know, at the end of that era of the band, and um, it's my favorite Kiss album. So that's why it's, why it's my number one. Awesome, yeah. This wow, <laughs> we, we made we've, it. We've cr- we we did it. We we cracked out another three parter. Holy shit, man! And uh, if and for those of you who uh, <laughs> who lasted this long. Um, so la- last time, I don't know if you've looked in the comments, but there's quite a lot of peanut butter platypus going on in the comments. I noticed. So, they, so people are listening. And so the fact that at least a handful of you listen to these podcasts all the way through, that makes it feel even more worth it doing these. Cause we already just have a fun time talking to each other about music. But once we hear that there are people that stick around for the whole thing, like that's, yeah, that's just totally awesome. Um, but so, yeah, so for those of you, for the, the peanut butter platypus crew, um, we thank you very much for uh, sticking around during our all of our tangents and our sing-alongs and whatever, <laughs> whatever the fuck else, our GTA San Andreas uh, commercials. <laughs> the fan interaction means, means a hell of a lot to us. Absolutely. And, um, and yeah. And, and so, and it's one of those things where I, I almost feel... Like, like I like getting input from everybody about bands that we should do, but I do think sometimes people will mention bands and I go, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of any right offhand, but occasionally somebody will mention a band like you should rank this. And I'm all like, really? I don't, I don't think we would have very much fun doing that, <laughs> but, but eventually we're going to get around to all sorts of bands. If we keep this shit going, like, you know, yeah. we're going to get to a point. That's why I think we've put off some bigger bands because you know, yeah. once you get them out of the way, what do you do? You come back to it a couple years later and see if you feel the same. Because that just seems like overkill at that point. But um, yeah, I I I just like I like the pattern we have. Really, it's just picking a different style each time, and then you know, 
even doing like years, maybe, maybe, maybe some other type of stuff in the future as well. We've started doing artwork. Absolutely. We did that. I do think that we should, because we, this isn't the first time we've mentioned it, but I do think we should choose a producer and rank our top five albums by that particular producer. Cause I think we also talked about like yeah. Bob rock and people like that, that, um, yeah. you know, there's or fucking, I don't know, Andy Wallace, like people that just come to mind. Um, people that just did Mutt Langer would be another Mutt good one. Lang, yeah, fuck yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, anyway, the point being, um, we have, I think we both have a, a long term viewpoint of where this podcast is going. Um, and so yeah. when you have that kind of vision, it makes it even better knowing that people are out there listening to it and enjoying it. So we thank you. Um, do you have any? As long as there's bands, as long as there's bands and albums to rank, we'll be here ranking them That's all. That's right. We're gonna we're gonna rank them. We're gonna crank and rank all night and part of every day because we have errands. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah. Anything? Anything final to say before we wrap this up? Uh, ooh, I don't know. I, I I look at my ranking list. And I'm still, I know it, I know we've said it now, we've done the episodes, <laughs> it's set in stone forever, yep. but so many of these albums swap places all the fucking yeah, time. Yeah, Like, this is a very flexible list for me, because it really does depend on the mood. There will be days where the 80s stuff far surpasses the 70s, and vice versa. You know, there'll be days I wake up and I think to myself... I'm not in an eighties mood at all. I want, I want something more stripped back in seventies. And it's, that's the beauty of a band that has such an extensive catalog across such a long time span yeah. is that you can get a vibe with so many different flavors. You know, you can hear the same voice doing something completely different. And I know? guess that speaks a lot to the quality of their output too. The fact that, because yeah. you know you, they could have different eras of a band, but you know it seems like a lot of bands there are those definitive like oh this is my favorite or this is you know, but but Kiss does have that quality where you could you can look at things and go well here's the albums that are undeniably good albums, but when it comes to a band like Kiss like what what are the albums that make you feel what, what do you have a good time listening to because I think with Kiss it's yeah it's always been about that the vibe has been you know, just fucking having a great time with your music. And there's, there's, there's little pretentiousness behind it. Um, and so, um, I mean, I guess maybe, you know, you, you could say that some of them seem pretentious, I guess, but I think musically, I think I saw it written somewhere that kiss makes dumb music for smart people. And, um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of agree with that. I, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's like if you're if you're in you're in it, then you're like you, you're nobody like 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 literally episode number one. Like we fucking made so much fun of Kiss, but we still enjoy it. So there's that's there's something to be said about a band like that, and there aren't a whole lot of bands like that. And 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 if there are other bands like that, I think Kiss is the template for those bands. They've also got a great sense of humor about yeah. it because especially especially nowadays because like. You watch like the interview where Ace keeps laughing. Oh, I love and that one. You can see, G yeah, and you can see like Gene is getting visibly annoyed, but even in the end, he ends up laughing yeah. too. And you know, it does it does make me kind of sad that that original lineup, just seeing them all there laughing, eventually, you know, it does it does make me wish that they'd kind of stayed together because I like oh I like these guys I like these guys together in a room, but yeah, yeah. So some things, some things have to happen. And I, I really do hope since we're, we're wrapping this up, I really do hope that before the end of the kiss story, um, because you know, they were doing their last tour and they're eventually going to have a last show. I, I just, I hope that they involve Peter and ACE, um, in yeah. some respect, have them come out and do a song. The last song you play of your entire careers, um, maybe have, have the original dudes come out and wrap it up. But from what I'm hearing, especially from Ace Frehley, that's not even a thing that they've put on the table. So that's a, that's wow. a little bit shitty. But you know what? It's their career. And like I said before, we don't know 
what all went on. Like all, all we get is everyone's accounts. Yeah. We get people's personal accounts of things. And I mean, I've read a lot about kiss over the years. And if you really put all that together, it's hard to define who the asshole is in the band. Cause they all seem <laughs> like they were all assholes. And so, um, it just sucks, but you know, it's their career. They're still an iconic band. And I still, you know, obviously Gene and Paul have been the driving force behind the band since day one. So really, you know, they're the heart of kiss. So, I mean, if they don't yeah. want, uh, the cat man and the space man, uh, well, the, the real cat man and space man, um, back <laughs> in there, then, uh, that's, that's up to them. And I don't fault them for it because it's their, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just an outsider. I'm just a fan. But anyway, um, so yeah, that on, on that note, thank you all for listening to the Kiss uh, ranking. I think next time we come back with the band, maybe a slightly shorter discography. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I think the next time that you hear from us, uh, we will be tackling another year, correct? Yeah. And um, yep. we're actually going to make a smooth transition into a year that is related to Kiss in a way, um, in a big way. Pretty heavily. Pretty heavily. And so, um, so yeah, so, but, but we're not going to let you know, and it's, you're going to be surprised because it's going to be a fun one I, for me anyway, I'm going to enjoy it. Um, so yeah, so, uh, that's it for this episode of cranked and ranked, uh, as, as always, I, I've said it like 50 times already. Thank you so much for listening and, um, go subscribe to Eddie Sparks on YouTube, subscribe to old head on YouTube. If you haven't yet, um, like and subscribe and if you if you listen to this podcast go and leave a comment and a rating on there because i think that's part of what brings yeah. us up in the ranks and podcasts so wherever you wherever you listen to this spotify apple podcasts what are the other ones like stitcher and stuff like that um yeah just five star review yeah, yeah five star review and glowing glowing review of 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 how we're this just the best podcast you've ever heard and then maybe eventually we will get a sponsor <laughs> <laughs> we can we can start <laughs> shilling for shit that we don't even care for. Kiss air guitar strings. <laughs> or, no, more likely it's going to be like medicated foot rub, <laughs> or something like that. Which honestly, I, I would be okay with that. I'd be like, send some of that over here. I could probably use it. This episode is brought to you by Vagiclean. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I really hope uh, that happens. Anyway, you- so yes, thank you very much for listening. And on that note, Eddie, take us out. Later, dude!